good to be here with you. It is. It's really nice. I was thinking we've actually never done an event together. I don't think. No, I don't know how that's possible because there are um, there's much in our work. There's a lot of commonality in the themes, and um, and obviously our poetry as well. But in our prose, I thought it was really interesting how we both centered on girlhood. Mm. And and I was really interested in what what drew you to that particular time in life because I found that that energy that you have at sort of around girlhood particularly interesting is something I really was it was something I was kind of always orbiting around and yeah. um I wonder what it was about that that time in our lives just yeah, so, I, you know yeah definitely and I think it's I mean I don't know how you feel about it but I've never been particularly drawn to writing about that in poetry no. um, I've written one poem about kind of teenage um which I, I liked I think I enjoyed writing but I never kind of thought oh this is something I really want to explore kind of at length it kind of felt like a slightly anomalous little dip into the into the theme um so I think it's interesting as well to think about potentially why we've both touched on things like family and um, personal experience and identity and those things in poetry, but have made the decision to kind of explore it fully in a, in prose, um, mm. but specifically in kind of poetic prose, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I think, I think I, I don't know, kind of on paper, I, I it wouldn't really be something I'd be that interested in, exploring Mm. necessarily like I don't I don't um I wouldn't think oh you know I'd love to explore that time in life um but I think through the lens of something else it actually becomes it's it's a way of looking at it so exactly how you've done in somebody loves you you're using a total a framing and other preoccupations to look at all of that stuff that comes around with girlhood and that age which I think is probably what I was trying to do as well with using trampolining as a lens rather than just saying, you know, this is a book about this. We've both kind of come at it. We've kind of circumnavigated it a little bit and it still sits at the heart of the books without being necessarily what you would say the books are about, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I I um, I understand. I completely understand what you mean by that because I, I think that maybe that's the poetic part, which is actually you're looking at something, but actually the most interesting things are things that are happening in the periphery. Um, So yes, ostensibly, this is, you know, um, about a really uh, something I don't know anything about trampoline. So you you learn quite a lot about that, but actually sideways on is all these other interesting things that are gathered up around girlhood, the body, the politics of the body, Mm. um the conventions of the body what the the limits of the body you know and then um the language of the body because the language is always communicate the body's always communicating something Mm. um but I guess in terms of like the girlhood theme I think there is something really interesting around that time when you are just at that point you know you're moving you're, you're 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 still um malleable and you're you, you're sort of not you're not you're sort of very porous as well to your surroundings and and I think that's something I'm really interested in I have to say that I do have two teenagers and I did have two teenagers when I was writing the novel and I was really really fascinated by what was happening to them and how they they were changing and and they sort of became my reluctant muses in a way because I was just fascinating by how that that energy had changed and how how their thinking was changing how their bodies were changing of course and and I think there's no you know we're adults for a very really really long time but that period of change is something we don't really see it you know to that extent it's something something really sort of special there's a special energy that I thought I found was really really fascinating um and and it made me realize that we forget actually we feel sort of disconnected from it a little bit and it made me connect with that Mm. a little bit as well yeah that's um that's really interesting because I think a lot of what I was interested in looking at in my book was um obviously memory and 
trying to tap back into a time when you are experiencing things in a way that you obviously don't anymore and you're absorbing information differently and your recollections are probably really flawed or really kind of um, heightened or unreliable a lot of the time. Mm. So I was sort of, I, I think it's interesting that I'm maybe looking back from a from a huge distance in lots of ways, whereas you maybe also were doing that, but you had a kind of, you had real life examples in a way, you had the kind of, that direct connection with with the subject and with those issues, I suppose, um, kind of, I guess, in a way, maybe looking in a mirror, sort of, even if you're not, you know, writing, obviously writing about yourself, you're, you're writing yeah. about that time and, and all of those preoccupations and concerns. So I guess you're, you were confronted with it in a way when you were writing, maybe in a way that I wasn't. So I was kind of like, you know, I don't have any teenage girls in my life really at all. Yeah. Um, so it feels for me very, very, like, I feel like I'm really looking back on something and aware of how, probably how unreliable I am now as a narrator, which is what I was kind of interested in. And which I, I feel like your, yeah, your your kind of voice in the book and your, um way of looking at things with all of the kind of you know confusion uncertainty of that age feels more kind of direct maybe and more mm. um like on more solid ground somehow in a way but and I wonder if that was because you had you had the the twins and you were you know you had them as a kind of living muse I guess yeah I mean um I probably haven't admitted that to myself very often because I don't want to feel that there's the you know my biography is in the book mm. that's not very to me that's not really very interesting but I have drawn from memory and I have drawn from experience and obviously try to do something with that to transform it and to make it into something but memory is really interesting because I think that the way you deal with the managed memory uh, in in the book is um it's very it's not a linear even though there is a sort of linear linearity of the of you know there's a there's a beginning of your journey the trampolining and then stopping and then you sort of um the fallout of that actually as well like as an adult looking back but actually your the way that you deal with memory and you the the fit the way that you flip back and forth I think is very um circular um it feels as if that that dealing with memory which I find really fascinating and I and I think the form is very interesting we can come to that actually because I think the form that we both take to deal with how we trip over memory and how much it makes us who we are mm -hmm. is a real challenge yeah. so um so it, you can't just you can't you have to think about form in that in a different way and form and memory on um, both our books are dealt with I think in very similar ways mm. yeah I think yeah form is obviously something we should definitely talk about because we've both um made yeah made a move from having uh poetry collections out and and that I think definitely I mean I don't want to speak for you but really informs these books I think um mm -hmm. even though they're prose obviously they're um whatever you want to call them you know lyrical prose poetic prose um, fragmented prose, all of that stuff. Experimental um, novels. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, what was your, did you have a really cl clear idea in your mind when you, before you started writing, did you know exactly how it want, you wanted it to look, kind of what you wanted the form to do, or did that kind of present itself as oh, you started? That's, I think, a really um, interesting question because um, I wrote a book of poetry and then I started to and then I sort of had a period of not wanting to write very much after um uh small hands and I had this kind of voice in my head and it was Ruby's voice um and she was obviously silent and um she doesn't speak and so so he so I was trying to sort of write her out and I didn't quite know what it was that I was doing or what, what it was that she, she was. Initially, I thought it might be a, an, um, a poem or, or something, but it was very clear once I got to about 4,000 words that I wasn't in poetry anymore. I was in a different, a different world. 
a different room actually it felt very very different and I don't know how you felt about when you were writing in prose but it just felt like um it 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 required a different sort of attentiveness like poetry requires like I direct direct attentiveness but this was sort of different it needed a different m- me to attend to it differently and so I tended to the voice and then um and then and then I realized I just had had a, had a, a voice and a novel but I didn't really know what it was I couldn't even call it a novel actually and then I just decided to show it to, to a couple of people and then I it didn't feel because you what she wasn't saying very much it didn't feel also like a novel like it didn't feel like um it wasn't populated with characters that were normal kind of conventional characters and then I didn't really know what it was and then I sort of um decided it really didn't matter I just needed just to write it and then see what happened and then I think the form was really really difficult and um I think really my editor helped me quite a lot with that because I had sh- very short pieces of prose and then sort of more like poems like prose poems you might call them all in the same book and and I think she emboldened me and basically said don't worry about it don't try and make it a conventional thing mm-hmm. uh, and just work with what you're trying to do which is trying to evoke memory and trying to give voice to somebody who doesn't talk so yeah. of course there's not going to be dialogue in it um that was the hardest challenge that was a hardest challenge but once I sort of worked out that that was what I had freedom to do that and I had a publisher and an editor that were going to give me that freedom I felt very uh confident that I could write it in the way I wanted to write it even though you know as you say, you don't quite, you're not quite sure where you are sometimes. Are you in prose? Are you in poetry? You know, and the same with you. I, I like the fact that actually in your book, I'm not sure it's sort of your, it, you're not sure footed, you know, are you in a prose poem? Um, there's some lines where I just think, gosh, that, that could just be a, a, a couplet, you know? So, and I quite like that. I like that work that you have to do in the, mm. I like it not all being, you know, done for you. Sorry, yeah. it's a really long explanation. <laughs> no, no, it's great. There are, I kept writing little bits down as you were talking, so so many things I wanted to pick up on it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, I think in response to you, you kind of saying, oh, there's no, uh, Ruby obviously is silent, there's no dialogue, but you still have such, there's such a clear sense of um, voice and character still in your book. Like, I know, I feel like I know what everybody sounds like and I have a really strong sense of, people's personalities and characters even though you haven't you know at any point used you know traditional dialogue as it were with speech marks and all of that stuff you still manage to evoke this like really incredible sense of a people's book um without using that which is kind of I just think is really incredible so that was just a thing I wanted to say in passing um but yeah I think yeah and also when you said um that your editor said don't worry about it and emboldened you like I basically had exactly the same experience um and I don't think I would have written this book in the way that it is without um Robin at Makina and I think maybe for both of us this comes from having an independent publisher and not having to sell a book um based with a really clear idea of what it is I guess you know not having to do that work ahead of time and kind of stake your claim at the beginning before you know what the book is and saying this is how it's going to look this is what it is so I think that's kind of maybe we were both really afforded that freedom um because of the publishers we had um and yeah I had exactly the same thing I'd written an essay called on trampolining um maybe in like 2016 or something that was just a couple of thousand words um that was published in pain journal you know quite appropriately (laughs) um and then I wrote the like a 25 page poem in my last book in my last poetry collection um and then I was like oh I think I'm not kind of not quite done with this and I think the thing that made me feel able to um step into prose with it was kind of approaching it as a subject in some ways so I think when I've spent my whole life kind of thinking about trampolining and my experiences and that time in a very like close way in a very kind of like um sort of visceral way like responding to my own feelings and my body and my memories of it but I was like oh I'm going to look at trampolining as a uh, kind of a subject in a way so I ordered a couple of te- like old textbooks um, and started reading about it kind of from the perspective of a coach and a performer um, 
and I'd never ever thought of it in those in those ways at all and it suddenly became like I guess I got the distance from it a bit in a way and was able to think about it as something um that I was sort of an expert in without needing to you know fill it with so much kind of tension and all of that stuff so that made it feel possible and I think I had a really clear idea that I that I knew I I knew I couldn't write like straight prose I knew it couldn't be uh, you know, many thousands of words in paragraphs I just wouldn't um physically be able to do that I couldn't produce a, a book like that I don't think so I kind of always knew it would be doing doing something in in the margins or kind of blurring in the middle um and then I started writing it and then I was trying to like I was at a point where I was like do I want an agent who do I want to publish this sort of what what are my plans for this book if any and then I spoke to Robin at Makina and he was like I really wouldn't worry about um preoccupying your brain with questions about how it needs to end up looking whether it needs to appeal really broadly to an audience by adding another kind of I was like should I add an adjacent Mm. that's kind of more you know uh accessible do it and he was like please don't worry about any of that stuff just write whatever you want um and then which is just incredible like you don't that's that's no it is it gives yeah. you so much freedom I mean yeah. it's it really does and then you can he was like you can put poems in there if you want and I was like I knew I didn't want any poetry no. proper poet straight no. poetry in it um and yeah I think as soon as he said that I was like okay I can just you know I can do what I want now and it was interesting what you said about attending to it differently like I definitely felt the same like I think if you're working on a poem even if you it's normal for me at least like more of an intensive short Mm -hmm. kind of Mm -hmm. period of time you might tinker with it whereas Mm -hmm. this just kind of floated in my brain for a couple of years probably maybe longer um if I add it all up probably five or six years just kind of yeah floating about and then you start to kind of kind of get it down um yeah, I've just done a very long uh, <laughs> rambling. No, it's great. <laughs> I find it fascinating because I'm always really interested in in writers' process, but also in particular, um, write poets who do other things and how mm. different it feels because you you kind of your mothership is poetry, and then you're kind of like going off and. But of course, the kind of hum in the whole in the book is always poet the poetry is always mm-hmm. there I mean I have to say I what I really found so interesting about your your book was the fact that there are, there is how you balance the you mentioned pain before which seems to be just like a constant weather in the book it's just mm-hmm. there the whole time that um but there's this kind of like constant balance between the awful and the beautiful because and I think that and there's that flitting between those two poles the whole time Mm -hmm. but how you manage that in a really um unsentimental way like in a very cool way and I think that writing into that is very very hard and it could you know a another writer would have handled that in a very different way. And I really, really liked the way you handled that because I felt that that was like, um, that was a poetic part that I kind of really, I was fascinated by how you handled that um, and managed those two things together. Yeah. There's a lot of pain in the book and there's a lot of the body in the book in pain. And, um, but it's, it would be very difficult to read that book, but it's sort of, balanced by this other thing that you're doing around language really and how you're handling that and I wanted to I mean uh, you you wouldn't have you've done that obviously very naturally um but sometimes we don't see it but I wanted to say that to you thank you yeah I think um yeah I think it must all be just kind of the gifts that poetry gives not gifts I don't mean gifted but you know the the um the, the the bonuses the benefits of of having started with poetry you kind of maybe have a, a slight at least a, a very acute awareness or an instinct towards pushing things um and implying and all of that stuff without like really just laying it all out there so I think I was really I was really mindful of um not making this sound like a book where because my basically my parents read some had read some early stuff and I think they 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 felt like it basically sounded like many years of suffering and unhappiness which was like obviously not 
true no. at mm-hmm. all. So I, I wanted to be really clear that the the most kind of acute memories I had were obviously probably the most joyful and the most yes. difficult or painful. Yes. And around that, you've got all sort. You've got ninety five percent of your life being just other stuff and probably not interesting enough to write mm-hmm. about. So we're kind of you're picking your you're picking the sort of um, the concentrated end of um, of things. So yeah, I really wanted to make sure that I was um, giving like due credit to the experience and the process without kind of implying you know I think I was really aware I really I really really wanted to be clear that the pain I experienced and the um pressure and all of that stuff really is pretty insignificant in comparison to what a lot of people go through in their lives Mm -hmm. so I really didn't want it I didn't want it to be like catastrophic in any way because people spend every single day of their lives in incredible pain and like the, that is not my experience and that wasn't my experience so I wanted to be really careful with how I talked about pain and the body because like I mean you know I'm able-bodied and I'm incredibly privileged and all that stuff so I kind of I think the whole time I was keeping a real eye on balance and um being th- thoughtful I guess in everything but at the same time as kind of um doing yeah doing credit to to those experiences and those kind of and you know everyone pain is a very universal experience yeah Yeah. so it felt you know even if people don't know exactly and it's a funny one because pain is you know what pain is but when you're not in it you can't really Mm. you know you see someone in pain and you know you know what it is but you can't really um empathize with it sympathize with it I guess properly so I was um I wanted to kind of evo- evoke it without um yeah filling filling the book with it or moaning um so yeah and, and I wanted obviously to to be to be clear that I had a really beautiful childhood as well yeah. so yeah. Many ways. um and like life is full of um terrible things and really incredible and beautiful things so mm-hmm. that feels important to me I think all the time um when I write um I feel like not to just ask you the same question back, but you are doing a similar thing in balance. I feel like your the book is very funny to me in loads of ways. Like um, Ruby's a very funny character. Like the way she thinks about people and the descriptions she gives of people are like it's just quite dry and very funny. But then also you're kind of dealing with a few things that crop up that are very troubling and very painful. Um, and yeah, I wondered exactly the same for you. Were you, when you were writing, I imagine the kind of, maybe the driver for you was capturing the the difficult stuff. Did you feel like you were balancing it out or was it that mm. Ruby Chris was so clear to you that you knew she was just kind of funny? Like, I, do you think of her as funny? Like, it just seemed very obvious to me that she was, but yeah. maybe not. Um, I, th- I think, again, it's a really good question. And I, I think that, I I do feel as if if it, if the book had just been about melancholia, you know, uh, which a lot of the you know a lot of the characters are suffering from, and and also there's all sorts of other challenges around, you know, not only mental health but racism and um, you know issues around safety, women's safety, and um, I think if it had just been that, I think it would have just been a really it would have been a very difficult book to to read <laughs> um but I don't think I deliberately thought oh I just need to lighten it up I felt as if um the way that Ruby copes I think is by I mean she's I think sense it has sensitive antennae and mm. I think the way she copes is and navigates that world is to use she's an intelligent young woman and I think she uses humor and that wryness really to 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 make it more manageable in the world Mm -hmm. because otherwise I think it would just be horrific for her and so um I think that's just how she manages her world and and the reader I think hopefully will will understand that amongst all the kind of you know difficulties and challenges and some of it's horrible Mm -hmm. um 
they she manages to do all these other things as well and and have this in mind where she's stimulated and aroused by things you know and um those are rich those are rich things for her you know those are things she's experiencing that are rich um but in a similar way to to how you're handling your subject matter I think that those are those are not done in a sort of I hope not done in a in a conscious way really I think they just that's how the book handles yeah. handles it I mean it's so much of what you end up writing is um, it was sort of writing itself, <laughs> you know. I mean, I didn't yeah. know that Ruby is going to be like this. Um, I I just followed her, followed her through, and I realized that this is her. And at some point, she was a walking, talking Ruby with her own yeah. own ideas and her own brain and her own like sometimes quite to I had had to you know I had to basically just follow her mm. and um I mean I, I guess it was a bit different for me for you because um you are drawing on this real life situation when you were um a girl and and you sort of knew when it was going to end that was the hardest thing for me how do I end the book you know how mm. do I um but yeah. ending something and like with poetry we always know we're constantly ending you know yeah That's yeah a bit being a, a a poet is we know there's always going to be a last line quite quickly and we so a lot of what we do is end <laughs> endings yeah. are part of, of what, what we but it's very difficult different with a novel because um it takes a long long time to end something and also there's an expectation of the reader of how you end something yeah um, and it was interesting to see because I today when I went back to your to your book about how you were ending and how you were were going back to the beginning as well. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I was going to ask you about that. Was that how did you feel about ending this book? Was is this is there something that you gave much more attention to? And is there something about what I'm saying about the challenges of ending that you kind of understand and read? Yeah resonate with totally yeah I'd, I'd actually never thought about the fact that we're you know in every book we write this poetry you're ending 40 times maybe you know you're <laughs> constantly and maybe if some of them are slightly you know work better for some people than others you've kind of got you've got a lot of goes whereas in a <laughs> book when in a book of prose there's one end yeah um, I think I um I kind of always knew what the end would be um, and it actually stayed the same from the um, short essay that I wrote six years ago, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't think, oh, that's that's exactly where um, this book will end. But it never occurred to me there really would be a different one. Um, I had a, a period of time where I had planned. So basically the book ends with, um, yeah, the last time I was on a trampoline. Um, yeah holiday so now that was that's about 10 years ago now mm -hmm. and um there was a point when I was writing the book I was on holiday again um and there was like a little sunken trampoline in the garden of the hotel we were staying in and I had like a few bounces on that and I was like oh this is um oh, I really like this feeling and then when I got home I arranged to go to my old club um mm -hmm. my old trampolining club because my friend James who's in the book who yeah. now has a child yeah. um, his his um his kid was going um and his I think a, a couple of our friends were taking their kids along and I was like oh my gosh this is such a like yeah. circular yeah. like we, we started when we were three like they're taking their kids kind of just mm. like you know jumping about in a sort of really casual way so I was going to go then um and me and James were going to have a like a go on the trampoline again and I was like oh suddenly thought this actually might be an end this might be a different end to the book like maybe this is where I maybe this is where it will go instead um and I didn't know how I felt about that because I didn't know how I'd feel being on a trampoline again I didn't know what my body would do when I was on a trampoline I was like maybe my maybe my legs will just snap it'll like things things will happen um and then it ended up getting cancelled the whole the whole thing um which I think I was quite relieved about anyway um and I think it would have just created a whole load of mess in the book in terms of like trying to to you know rejig everything so basically that's a very long way of saying I think I naturally knew where it would end always and mm. even though like I don't really think of this book as 
yeah, linear, like a linear narrative at all. It does start at the beginning and it does end at the last time I, I went on a trampoline. So it feels quite, yeah, I guess within the kind of mess of the middle, you've got the, you know, overarching sort of, um, yeah, narrative that makes sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it felt relatively easy to me, I think, to end. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about kind of to go back a tiny bit um because I just assumed that Ruby would always have been Ruby as she is in in the book now but you just said um that she was like a walking talking Ruby at some point so she had a voice at a certain point oh sorry yeah not she all was, she didn't she wasn't talking oh, I see she wasn't yeah. <laughs> um uh, well actually that was that was a question I was gonna I was going to asking myself will she ever talk yeah I shouldn't really, I suppose, tell people just in case I haven't read the book, but I I did have to think about whether or not she would talk. And mm. um I didn't know. She she made those decisions, you know, she made a decision yeah. as to whether or not she's gonna talk or not talk or continue in her particular, you know, style. Yeah. Um, but I I do think that. I had to take my my hands off her at some point you know and just let her be who she needed to be and that was that was sort of strange because she literally was I mean there were times where I wasn't writing her and I felt like her voice um because she's a very very distinctive voice and um yeah. um I mean voice is something that we I mean I mean unless we sort of I mean I, we, I know every voice every poem has a voice um and often we use voice or we, we use dramatic monologue in our poems. And, you know, some say that certain poets have a voice, but generally character isn't something that we do yeah. as poets. And so I didn't really, I was at kind of at sea, you know, and I hadn't sort of gone on any creative writing novel courses as to how to do character. And actually I'm glad I didn't, because I think that um it just meant that I just had absolute freedom. I had no idea, you know, she, I sort of gave her some oxygen and she went off and sort mm -hmm. of did her own thing. But there were times where I um, felt as if I could get into the groove of Ruby. If I just sat at this particular place that I was writing, I put on my like disgusting writing cardigan and I just sort of wrote her, wrote Ruby. Um, and I don't know how unusual that is or whatever, but I just felt like I could, get into her you know by sort of you know just getting into the groove of ruby i don't think that really answers your question but um but no i just yeah i was really interested to know how i guess how fully formed she had appeared to you and if she her voice voice was very very clear and very yeah. distinct and um almost from the beginning she was sort of like there you know yeah. um yeah i mean yeah. She, she was sort of gifted to me really I feel I feel like I don't really know where she came from but I, in a way si the fact she was silent was an opportunity to maybe um visit other other a uh, visit her in a different way because she was silent and so there was all these other things that she was um senses that she was exploring you know uh, and other opportunities because she was quiet yeah but, yeah, yeah. And I think you really get a sense of that um you're getting kind of unfiltered access to her inner thoughts and brain, I suppose, in a way, and not being, you know, voice can sometimes, you know, we don't always say what we mean. We're kind of misleading a lot of the time. We don't even know, necessarily believe what we're saying. Sometimes, you know, you kind of just respond to situations um, and your voice is usually the way you do that. And it isn't necessarily a good reflection of the person. Whereas I, I guess with what we get with Ruby is, um, just direct access to her mm. brain and her inner, inner inner workings and everything's kind of yeah it feels deeper and more considered and heightened because of that I think it feels like dialogue her voice would kind of clutter it in some ways mm. um how did you approach her kind of the end I guess of the book and her journey ending because obviously not to like give anything away for anybody but things sort of um get a bit darker towards the end maybe and sort of unravel um or you know with yeah the things aren't necessarily crumbling but think things feel like the, the like change is happening for her yeah. and kind of around her was there a temptation for you to kind of 
go further into that or to kind of wrap things up and, and make things really hopeful at the end and kind of everything will be okay yeah how did you where did you go right that's that's my final full stop yeah so um so the ending the end end scenes I wrote very early on and thank goodness I did because otherwise I just don't think I would have finished the book mm. um because I didn't map out the book um I sort of went with this dialogue and and then um the scenes the dialogue and and Ruby sort of told me how how the book would shape and then and then I just sort of thought well I just don't know how it's going to end and this this scene came to me this kind of very very clear scene came to me with her and her mother and I remember writing it down and thinking it was very important mm. because I knew that at least I knew that there was a that that was that was the end point and at some point she was going to have to end up there yeah so and so at least it was a marker a clear marker and it was really important, I think, to have that. I mean, I'm so glad that it just came, that that scene came. And um, things aren't tidied up and, you know, but then life is not tidy. And we we are not writing those sorts of books. You know, neither of us are writing those sorts of books. And actually, um, I'm not really interested in like a conventional closing book where people are sort of close a book and go, oh, that's great. You know, that's not that's not something that really that's not something that I'm interested in or, or fascinated by it's great then there are lot, lots and lots of books that are in the world that are like that and people can read those but I think with my book and your book as well I think we are inviting uh, a reader to participate a bit more maybe with their reading and and, and actually the gaps the spaces um, the poetry the the um, the lyric latches that are constantly left open in our in our writing, I think are invitations to just maybe to to read maybe read slightly differently. And I think that both our publishers, um, with all the kind of publishing and the books that they that they publish, I think allow that in in the literature world. And I think that you know small publishers actually do that. I think there there's risks in writing like that. I think those are the kind of books I want to read. And and I'm I'm really pleased that there seems to be more of an appetite for our type of books because yeah. doing something else, they're doing something different, you know, and we're learning how to read in a different way in those books. So yeah, I think it's a pleasure to read something that's slightly out, you know, a lot of these books will, will be seen as slightly out there, slightly on the edge. Well, I think that's really interesting. Those are the books I want to read and that, that fascinate me. Mm. Yeah, I think it sounds, I guess we've both written books that are the kinds of books we like to read ourselves, which <laughs> is sort of, a, you know, it makes sense. It's kind of, yeah, I, I have, I do have, I have real love um, sometimes for something very, like very painterly writing, things that are giving me, um, yeah really telling me how to see things um in the story and all of that stuff like there's obviously a time and a place for that and it can be done absolutely beautifully but I do I feel the same I really enjoy reading books where you're doing a bit more not work but a bit more kind of yeah your brain is doing more you're kind of more is being asked of you in terms of using your imagination and um questioning things and yeah like that that is that's what's interesting to me about being a reader um and I think that's yeah it's just natural isn't it if that's where you get your 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 joy from as a reader that's kind of what you want to put out there yeah. and it also I think if you're writing and you know you're a hundred percent sure yourself exactly what you're saying and you can be sure how you want to say it I think but I'm not a hundred percent sure how I feel about loads of stuff or how I feel about a lot of the things I'm writing about even my own experiences and I think when things are written in in that kind of very sort of neat authoritative way where the the writer is completely sure I don't find that particularly interesting I prefer those yeah the the, the kind of messiness and the nuance and complexity of writing where you everyone's kind of figuring out life and the world together and no one really has the answers um that's yeah 
and I think that's exactly what you've been saying I've just rephrased it slightly <laughs> differently but it's you know I think that's what we're preoccupied with and that's what poetry is often preoccupied with as well and it um yeah it just it makes for more interesting books I think um should we read a section yeah, from yeah, yeah. um shall I go for, I will read yes. I'll go yes. first um it's funny I I, I yeah I rarely read out loud from other people's words. <laughs> this is really exciting I'm gonna hold it up so oh. somebody loves you um so this is um Mona has asked me to read from the second section um which is called foxes the day my sister tried to drag the baby fox into our house was the same day my mother had her first mental breakdown in many ways it was the perfect morning for a breakdown the rain was spitting softly, the Parker's dog just wouldn't stop barking. It went on emitting that terrible noise like it was a machine loaded with everlasting batteries. In the living room, I had just finished watching a long documentary about wild kangaroos. Upstairs, there was a doctor, the aunties, and my father, of course. There was a toy, a miniature replica camera that my sister was jealous of, and she kept prizing the camera from my fingers and pointing it at things she liked the look of and saying, see, I can click, I can click, till eventually I had to steal it away from her and hang the long leather strap around my neck. For days we had known about the foxes. They had come closer and closer to the house and had been chewing at the garden boots my mum had stored under the corrugated plastic shelter. I went into the kitchen and the side door was open and there was Rania crouching on the steps carrying a bundle, a blanket covering the body so that only its ears and eyes were visible. I heard the front door click open then slam shut. The fox yelped and slipped away and we didn't see my mother again for three whole months. Thank you for reading that. Can you redo all my readings from now on please? <laughs> <laughs> we can just carry each other around with us like a ventriloquist puppet maybe <laughs> um and I'm going to similarly read from this beautiful book um and I'm going to read from page four to right the beginning of the book when I was a trampolinist I'd never felt like my movements were really taken on by my body it was more like my mind forced the movements into being rather than them happening in a way that felt instinctive or magical or inevitable I still imagine that a really gifted athlete becomes their movements as if the muscle absorbs them, no divisions or edges, the brain an ice cube melting into the body. The brain is like a horse. You love the horse. The horse's nose is so soft, but it will throw you off into a shallow stream and make you eat mud. A gifted athlete is able to tame their brain in such a way that their thoughts become like water by which I mean blood, running into every corner, but still under command. My mind would throw me backwards instead of forwards, trick me to land on my neck. I was not a gifted athlete. I knew it. I persisted. Thank you. It's nice to hear someone else read. <laughs> it was a pleasure to read it. It's such a, uh, it's such a beautiful section actually of the of the of the book because it's so um of the body as well so it sets up that you know the the rest of the the book so beautifully so yeah. um, thank you I was also thinking as I was reading yours like um something we haven't talked about but we both have these kind of I guess motifs popping up so you you know you have the foxes and you have um yeah I guess kind of in a way you might in a poetry collection things just cropping up throughout mm. um yeah we've, we've both kind of done a bit of that I think um we can't resist the sort of uh, <laughs> little sort of metaphorical um oh, poet, yeah. poetry traps yeah the foxes <laughs> in the pond and all of the stuff it's uh yeah we love it and, and, and also the symbolist flight that you take as well so those things around glass um and I, I love that. I love the way that the flight, your the, the imagination, the physical flight, and then the imaginative flight um, that you're you're taking and going off on, going off on one, which I really really yeah. love. 